The Tom Woods Show, episode 923. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, join Bob Murphy and me for the libertarian event of the year, the Contra Cruise. And this year, we're joined by special guests, including the great Scott Horton, the foreign policy expert you love from The Tom Woods Show. It's filling up faster than ever, so book right now at ContraCruise.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking today about the military budget. Man, this thing just keeps going up and up. It's almost as if there are certain vested interests that want to keep increasing the military budget. Well, we're going to talk about the details here, get into some of the numbers and what's going on with William Hartung, who is the director of the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. He just wrote a very good article on this subject of the the military budget and the numbers and where the money's going and very important questions like that. So you you definitely going to want to read the article. We'll link to it on the show notes page. He's also the author of Profits of War, Profits, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, but As you'll see, it could go either way. Prophets of War, Lockheed Martin, and the Making of the Military-Industrial Complex. Bill, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It seems that no matter what happens, no matter what happens, no matter who it is, no matter what the promises are, we get a bigger military budget. Now, in this case, Donald Trump promised that he was going to increase the military budget. And I think most people who knew anything about the subject were just shaking their heads in utter disbelief. What possible reason would you have for doing this, given the <laughs> when you compare the U.S. budget to that of the entire rest of the world put together? And secondly, the nature of whatever threat the U.S. is facing today does not seem to require more nuclear submarines or whatever the heck else they're going to try to bill us for. So when, when you hear we've got to increase the military budget to keep America safe, what's your visceral response to that? Well... I mean, based on what we need, uh, you know, I, I kind of scratch my head because, you know, as you said, you know, they're spending almost record levels, $600 billion a year, which is um, bigger than the next day countries combined. And six of those countries are our allies. You know, so <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no lack of money there. Um, and the kind of things that they have to deal with, like terrorist attacks, suicide bombers and so forth, they're not – thinking about what they would need to deal with that. So ballistic missile submarines, overpriced fighter planes, uh, you know, huge aircraft carriers that are uh, having cost overruns uh, are not going to do them a lot of good in dealing with what admittedly is is a very challenging problem, but they're not going to get very far if they spend on things that are completely unrelated to that. You note in your article, and I'm linking to this article, by the way, at uh, tomwoods.com slash 923, You've got in here a reference to a study at the Watson Institute at Brown University that released a paper and saying that since 2001, the United States has racked up in the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Syria, uh, not to mention the Department of Homeland Security. We're talking about $4.79 trillion in current and future costs. And it's interesting at a time like this to recall, you remember the cost estimates we got for the Iraq War back in 2002 and three? Remember those? Yeah, I mean, the $4.79 billion is mind-boggling. I mean, you know, a well, trillion, a trillion, trillion. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good thing I have you here to help me. Yeah. Uh, if only, if only it were just that. I mean, they they said fifty billion, and it ended up just Iraq being about sixteen times that. And then you had Afghanistan, you had Homeland Security. They stuffed some money both in this war budget that they have separately, and also into the Pentagon budget. And then, of course, there's the cost of taking care of our vets, and that that cost goes on for for the lifetime of these folks. So uh, that alone is another trillion dollars thrown into that four point seven nine trillion. Um, and, you know, we're arguing about things like, you know, how are we going to cut a trillion dollars over the next 10 years to balance the budget? Uh, we're cutting very small programs uh, by, by these standards, like a National Endowment for the Arts and Center for Public Broadcasting, Legal Services, Home Heating, Meals on Wheels. Uh, there's about eight target programs, Planned Parenthood. So their initial eight on their hit list uh, come in at about one half of 1% 
of the Pentagon's yearly budget, and then an infinitesimal amount of those, you know, that four point seven nine uh, trillion. So uh, there's a huge mismatch here. They're, they're looking in the wrong place, you know, if they want to save money. Can you break down, because in the article you break down where this staggering figure comes from. Of course, we would expect some of it comes from direct war spending, but oddly enough, that's only $1.7 trillion of the $4.7. What else has the money been spent on? Well, they've, you know, as I said, the $1.7 trillion, when they started these wars, they said, okay, they're unpredictable. We don't know what we're going to spend. Let's set up a separate, a separate account to pay for that. And, and they, they call that the Overseas Contingency Operations Account, because it sounds, well, I mean, it sounds kind of neutral. I mean, you know, it doesn't sound like it's killing people, which of course it is. Uh, and then the Pentagon's regular budget went up substantially because of the kind of war fear that was being spread, the, the, the kind of fear of terrorism and so forth. Uh, you know, that, that atmosphere of war allowed the Pentagon to up its regular budget. Uh, and then Homeland Security grew dramatically uh, to one of the top federal agencies uh, during this whole period. Um, you've got Veterans Affairs. That budget has tripled uh, because we've generated 2 million new vets from the Iraq and Afghan wars. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, taking care of those vets uh, could be a trillion dollars all by itself over their lifetime. So uh, that's, you know, half again, the direct spending on the war. So it's, you know, there's a lot of elements that go into it. And of course, we've increased our debt which has increased the interest on the debt uh, related uh, to this military spending. And I think when people think about war, uh, they don't think about this. You know, I, I mean, you know, the Bush administration kind of eased us into this war uh, with Iraq uh, on the idea that it would be, by Pentagon standards, uh, relatively cheap, you know, only $50 billion, which to most people is a lot of money. Uh, and there were even statements by some administration officials that said, oh, the war will pay for itself. You know, because, oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, we paid for it. In terms of the increase in the military budget that Trump requested, th this is just a stunning figure you've got here. He's requesting a $54 billion increase in military spending for 2018. Now, we're so jaded by big figures that we don't even know how to evaluate that. So you give us this comparison. Just that increase, just that $54 billion, is roughly equal to the entire annual military budget of France, larger than the defense budgets of the UK, Germany, and Japan, and only $12 billion less than the entire Russian military budget of 2015. That's a substantial sum. Now, how does this military spending of today compare historically with other periods in American history? Well, it's larger than the peak of the Reagan buildup, which is one of the biggest buildups uh, in our history, uh, you know, other than, of course, World War II. Um, it's, it's kind of in the ballpark with what we spent uh, during the Korean War. Uh, so these are times when there were hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of troops spread overseas to fight conflicts. Uh, these current wars, uh, although quite expensive, um, you know, there's, there's uh, 7,000 troops in Iraq and Syria, and probably another 7,000 or so uh, private contractors. Uh, Bush had 160,000 troops and a comparable number of contractors. So, you know, as you said, it never goes down. You know, even when the troops overseas go down, the troops, the war fighting troops, somehow they find ways to keep spending, you know, all this money. You wrote a book on Lockheed Martin. Um, you, it's called uh, Profits of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military Industrial Complex. I can't help sharing a uh, personal story relating to my 13-year-old who's who just finished eighth grade. And this was, let's see, this was a few months ago. For some reason, heaven knows what, somebody from Lockheed Martin, we live in Florida, and there's a, I've driven by a big complex, says Lockheed Martin on it. Somebody from there was coming to her school, and the students were told they could ask the representative whatever they wanted. And I was not going to have my 13-year-old asking, uh, you know, how fast do your planes go or whatever, which, of course, she in a million years wouldn't have dawned at her or asked me. She said, Dad, what, what's a good, juicy question I can ask this guy? You know, <laughs> So we had fun sitting around plotting something. And this is what we came up with. I wanted her to be respectful. And this is the question 
that she asked. She said, um, should Americans be concerned that a lot of people from Lockheed Martin wind up in government where they advocate military spending and foreign policy that appear to benefit Lockheed Martin? (laughs) 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 He wasn't totally ready for that question, but let me ask you that question because I don't know that many of the details of uh, Lockheed Martin, but obviously you do. Is that a reasonable question for her to have asked? Uh, yes, and it's brilliant, you know, to think that I'm sh- I'm sure the Lockheed Martin rep thought they were going to come in, get a bunch of softball questions, right? <laughs> right. Kind of, you know, wow the kids with all the stuff they were doing, and so th- this this had to be a, a wonderful moment. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely right. I mean, you know, the golden era for Lockheed Martin was in the Bush years when they had people go into government, uh, deputy national security advisor head of military space operations at the Pentagon, helping the DOE run the nuclear warhead program. Uh, they, they had, you know, eight people going right at the top and then many more at lower levels. In, in the Trump years, some other companies are getting a better inside track. Um, Secretary of Defense Mattis came straight off the board of General Dynamics, which makes tanks and will make the new uh, ballistic missile submarine at $8 billion a pop. Uh, there's a guy from Boeing's Missile Defense Division who's going to be Mattis's deputy at the Pentagon. Um, head of Homeland Security, a uh, former general, had a defense consulting firm uh, before he came into the government, and many more. Uh, there's a guy named Lee Fang, who's a very good writer at The Intercept, who found uh, about 16 examples of corporate folks who came into government uh, just in the Trump you know, transition, and he hasn't actually appointed that many people. Uh, he's been, they've been arguing about who can, you know, fits their standards to even go into government and they've been blocking some of Mattis's potential appointments and so forth. So 16 out of a very small number that have actually been appointed is, is a huge number. Yeah. Yeah. That now that is, but at the same time, I think there are some people who feel like it just seems too crude. It can't be that what's really going on here is that there's a company that, or a group of companies that are simply lining their pockets, that they don't have the best interest of the U.S. at heart, but that war is a profitable thing and they are ready to cash in on it. I think there are a lot of people who can't grab is, – but I mean, is that is that how you would characterize it or is it more complicated than that? I think that's the bottom line. Uh, you know, I, I think there are some in the industry who want to meet, you know, the nation's defense needs and so forth. Uh but that question of what we need is so distorted, primarily by the lobbying of these companies. You know, so uh, we don't need more nuclear overkill. You know, I mean, we've got 4,000 to 4,500 nuclear warheads. And even if you think that's the best way to go, to have nuclear weapons, to deter other countries from attacking the United States, um, some Air Force strategists did their own assessment. They said, well, you know, maybe 300 would, would do the job. So we have 15 times what we need, and yet the corporations are lobbying for to spend a trillion dollars over the next three decades for new submarines, new bombers, new ballistic missiles based on the ground, uh, you know, a new missile defense system, more new kinds of warheads at the Department of Energy. So uh, right there, we're not talking about defense needs. We are talking about primarily lining the pockets of the contractors. And, of course, there is – some distorted thinking. There's a lot of Cold War thinking that's still embedded in the Pentagon. It's kind of this nuclear priesthood that says, well, if we build X, then they might do Y, and therefore we have to build X. And, you know, if they have thousands, we need more than that. And, you know, all of that is is kind of nonsense, except for the fact that it, of course, drives this nuclear arms race, which is not just expensive, but puts us at risk that one of these things is going to be used at some point, even if by accident. One of the themes in your article, and is repeated toward the end, involves contrasting how much the U.S. government is spending on the military with what it has to show for this spending. Now, do you mean in terms of the hardware that it's getting or the results that it's getting? I'm thinking of the results primarily. I mean, it's true. The hardware often doesn't work. Uh, The F-35, for example, which is the most expensive program ever undertaken by the Pentagon, um, you know, they're, they're starting to ramp these up and put them into full production. And yet, you know, they can't reliably communicate with troops on the ground. They're not very good against other fighter planes. Uh, they can carry relatively few bombs compared to existing planes. 
they're not really that great at supporting troops on the ground. So uh, about all the things this plan is asking to be to do has been done better by planes that already exist, and yet we're throwing all this money at it. So, so there is that issue of performance. Uh, but then you look at the wars we fought. I mean, the Iraq war with all the money that was poured into that, um, and we ended up with a sectarian government that so alienated its own people that when ISIS came in, uh, they put up you know, minimal fight in many communities because they thought, what could be worse than what we already have? You know, Our leaders are being jailed, we're being attacked by government-supported militias and so forth. Um, and so we, we created a climate where ISIS could succeed. And, and so this is the initial idea that you know, we're going to move into Iraq, we'll get rid of the dictator, we'll put in a democracy that's pro-U.S., and oh, by the way, it might help U.S. oil companies. Uh, none of that came to be. Uh, so, no, so no matter how you define U.S. security, no matter how hawkish you are, uh, it's very difficult to make a case that that intervention in Iraq uh, made sense. And then, of course, in Afghanistan, we've been there for the longest period in U.S. history, and the Taliban is as strong as ever. So, you know, using force to solve these complicated problems has not gotten the job done. Well, meanwhile, over in Europe, I'm interested because you are the director of the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy, and I'm curious to know your opinion on NATO, if if NATO has outlived its usefulness or if, as we're told, it's now quite useful in the battle against terrorism. I don't know what to believe. The battle against terrorism is just everything I hear about it is all propaganda. So as soon as I hear that, my uh, uh, you know my skeptical antenna go up. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, Donald Trump said, well, he said two things, you know, they're not spending enough. And he also said, well, until I brought it up, they weren't even, you know, uh, fighting terrorism. Uh, but of course, they've kind of followed the U.S. lead in sending troops to Iraq and Afghanistan, which has taken up a substantial chunk of the budgets of the NATO allies. Um, now, sure, I mean, if Russia's messing around in the Baltics and they're, uh, you know, doing what they did in Ukraine and so forth, um, there's got to be some way to address that. But these countries are already collectively outspending Russia. And uh, some of Russia's tactics, uh, it's not, you know, tanks at the border. It's its infiltrating a few people. It's propaganda. It's cyber war. So they need a new strategy for dealing with that new kind of warfare. And the kind of things they've been buying don't really meet that standard. So I think if NATO was restricted to the defense of Europe and then they gave some thought to, okay, which country does which function, how do we deal with this new era of warfare, that would make sense. But what they're doing is they're kind of buying into this idea of NATO as a global interventionary force, and I think that's a huge mistake. What has been your opinion about the expansion of NATO, with more and more countries entering it? Could that be taken as a provocation to the Russians? I mean, Montenegro, for heaven's sake, and 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 the Baltic states. I mean, these are the. If it's really true that an attack on one NATO country is an attack on all, and this therefore obligates the U.S. to go to war with a nuclear power over Latvia, I wish the Latvians the best of luck. But uh, this seems like an irresponsible guarantee. Yeah, um, I was writing. Uh, well, I don't want to show my age, but uh, back in the 90s, when I was at least younger than I am now, uh, about the initial NATO expansion being a mistake. Because, you know, at the end of the Cold War, uh, Secretary of State Baker had let the Russians know that, well, you know, if Germany unifies um, and, you know, East and West come into one country that's, you know, allied with NATO, that'll be it. We're not going to expand NATO up to your borders. And then, of course, that's exactly what they did. And Russia has its own perspective on these things, uh, which goes back many years. I mean, you know, given what happened to them in World War II and the huge losses they had, some call them paranoid. Some just say they have a long historical memory. But anyway, the idea of, a, you know, an opposing alliance rolling right up to their borders uh, caused great consternation, especially since it was in contravention to a pledge that had been made to them that that was not going to happen. And then, of course, there was the rearming of all those countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, a lot of it with U.S. arms, a lot of it driven by U.S. companies. There was a group called the Committee to Expand NATO that was run by a um, Lockheed Martin vice president, a guy named Bruce Jackson. And they were over there selling their wares and you know pitching their stuff even before those initial countries Join NATO. Uh, so, yeah, I, th I think that 
idea of expanding NATO is viewed in Russia as being encircled. Um, you know, maybe viewed on our part as some sort of prudent defense strategy. But I think part of defense strategy is you got to think how other countries are going to react. And I think a lot of what uh, Russia's hawkishness now stems back to that that idea of expanding NATO and, and what you know how they perceived it. Can you just tell me about the Center for International Policy and what your goals are? Yeah, uh, well, we're an independent think tank, and unlike a lot of think tanks in Washington, well, the majority of them, uh, we don't take defense contractor money, we don't take U.S. government money, and so we're trying to create kind of an independent take on a lot of these things, and, and we're for you know, a more peaceful world, a more economically sustainable world, a world where human rights are uh, prevalent instead of being ignored, as the current administration uh, loudly has proclaimed that it will do. I mean, you know, he, Trump goes on a trip and he's cozy as could be in the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia. And then he goes to visit our democratic allies and he's like a fish out of water and he's, you know, uh, confronting them. So his priorities are almost exactly the opposite of what they should be. So anyway, we have very ambitious goals, but our feeling is if there's not an independent voice making some of these points, uh, we're never going to get there. How can people find out more about what you guys do? Uh, well, we're at CIPonline.org. Also, if you just Google either my name, William Hartung, or Center for International Policy, uh, our website is the first thing that will uh, pop up. What you're talking about does run pretty counter to what we might call the bipartisan foreign policy consensus. I mean, of course, there's some change in emphasis. Uh, as you say, there's no doubt that Trump is looking to to dial up some of the conflicts that we saw under Obama. But still, by and large, they have the same assumptions, the same commitments. How does a think tank like yours crack through that? Well, you know, we just try to do a lot of media and a show like yours, of course, is very helpful in that. Um, you know, I've had pieces in the New York Times. I write in a lot of the D.C.-focused publications. We do have some allies on the Hill who are willing to speak out. Not a majority, but sometimes, uh, you know, a determined minority can can make a significant dent in it, you know, holding off a bad policy. Uh, at the moment, there's a uh, initiative to block the latest arms deal to Saudi Arabia, which would give them bombs for a war they're doing in Yemen where they're killing uh, thousands of civilians. And uh, Senator Chris Murphy, uh, Al Franken, Rand Paul have been leading that effort. Not clear if we can win it in a Republican Senate, but the bigger vote, the better in terms of sending a message to the Saudis that not everybody here is, you know, happy with what they're doing or, you know, that there's there's a lot of opposition, which is, is growing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. And, and of course, we're networked. So we work with many other organizations that are uh, pulling in the same direction. And on some issues, there's kind of a left-right convergence. Uh, there's a lot of libertarian groups think the Pentagon's spending too much money, think we should stop doing these foreign interventions. Uh, they're against mass surveillance on, uh, you know, uh, personal freedom grounds and so forth. So, you know, on certain issues, uh, I'm horrified at their agendas, specifically on domestic things. But there are areas where we overlap, and so we can have this kind of uh, coalition of convenience to fight, and, and therefore you've even got some Republicans, uh, particularly in the House, who are questioning the Pentagon, you know, what, what do you need all this money for? And, and for that matter, why should we give money to an institution that can't even audit its own books and t tell us where the money's going? Well, I would love to live in a world where we could just sit down and hash out our domestic differences without having to worry about what the heck are these sociopaths doing all over the world. And I guess I know this sounds really cheesy, but I have five daughters, and ever since I had kids, it's just even when I – I know how cheesy this sounds, but I would take the garbage out to the curb, and it would be quiet at night, and I would sit and imagine what it would be like to hear an air raid siren and be worried about what's going to happen to my kids. And that is a real experience of a lot of people around the world, and I'm lucky that I live in the heart of the hegemon, but – other people aren't so lucky. And so to me, foreign policy is the most important thing. It is, it's the when it comes to morality and, and just everything, everything down the road. And, and not only that, not only is it is it grotesquely immoral what they're doing, as you say, they have zero to show for it. I mean, at least if they could say, well, we got the bad guys, you'd say, well, I don't like how you did it, but at least you have something to show for yourself. They have nothing uh, except fat pockets 
and and uh, a lot more power and influence. So that's why I am so happy to work with anybody who feels the way I feel about this. And and by and I frankly I go even way beyond a lot of the people I work with on this, even people on the left. I wrote a book with Murray Polner, who's on the left, called "We Who Dared to Say No to War." But I'm the guy who, when I'm on that airplane and they're telling me I got to clap for the troops, I just don't do it. I'm sure some of these are decent people who've been misled, but. You know, you shouldn't have gone and fought in the Iraq war. You just shouldn't have. You should have refused to do it. So I'm not going to stand up. I'm not going to applaud. I I'm not, I don't care if you get the 10% discount at the ice cream store. I, I just – I don't go for any of this superstition about the military. I think that in itself is perpetuating the problem. It's a, it's a, it's a superstitious uh, religious reverence we're taught to have for this institution. We did not have this. When I was growing up in the 80s, yeah, the military was fine. But it wasn't like there's a military demonstration in front, before every Super Bowl. and it, it hadn't gone completely berserk. I guess 9-11 must have done that. I think so. And there's no question there's a lot of courageous people in the military, but they've been sent on the wrong missions, you know. Uh, and there's plenty of other heroic people who deserve plaudits. You know, I mean, there's teachers, there's nurses, there's people that are uh, dealing with uh, domestic issues. There, there's the citizens who tried to uh, intervene when there was attack on a, on a Muslim in, uh, in the West Coast. And, uh, you know, people lost their lives doing that. There's plenty of other uh, areas where courage has been shown. So I think we should applaud s- some of that as well, because some of those things, uh, which the Trump administration is actually cutting money for, uh, save people's lives. Right, tell us one more time what the website is. Uh, it's CIPonline.org or just uh, Google Center for International Policy. Okay, and I'm going to link to that also at tomwoods.com slash 923. Well, Bill, thanks for your time today and uh, good luck in all your important work. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, that's going to do it for us for today. If you've been enjoying the show, consider becoming a supporting listener. You'll be part of the Tom Woods Show Elite. You get many, many great benefits as a supporter of the show. Check it out at supportinglisteners.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.